Okay. We got a lot of robot stuff going on. So what's uh, what's this? Robot pack. We got a pulley. Uh, this pulley works with our TT motors. We have uh, the yellow TT motors. And we have some more in stock. But I want to show this off because it's kind of a neat. It's, I'm trying to get little add-ons to our motors. So this is just a pulley. Oh, that's all over there. Oh, yep. yeah. um, you attach it on. It comes with a little screw. And it's hard to zoom in. Um, you just with a screw, and it has a, a little grooved uh, pulley wheel. So good if you you know you have rotational motion here, and you want to rotate something over there. Maybe you want to change the RPM by gearing it up or down. Um, so this is just a really nice low cost plastic attachment that is like easy to drill or cut, and it has some holes in it. So I think it's really good for some you know projects where you want to pull something or turn something or twist something. Low cost plastic pulley add on for your TT motor. Okay, next up. You're like, oh, you know, I like the TT motor, but I really wish you had a motor with metal gears. Well, we do. Um, we now have a version of um, the TT motors. These are gearbox motors. And the yellow one that I just showed you has plastic gears, which means it's lightweight, it's fairly quiet, and it's low cost. But um, let's say, hold on. Well, they, they look the same. Let's say you're like, okay, I want to build a robot where I need more torque. And um, the plastic gears can strip. I want the motors to be a little um, slower and more powerful. Let's see, I want to be careful when I remove this. Oh. So this version, um, we have a version with full metal gears. So you can see it's all machined gears. Um, it is uh, geared down 190 instead of 180 to 48, so it's twice as slow, but it's of course uh, twice as powerful at least, and also um, the gears will not strip because they're all metal, and even the motor, that uh, gear, the little one here, is um, metal and press fit on. Okay, and we have another one. We have two, they look identical on the outside, because it's the inside that counts, and so the inside one, yes, or the other one, is half plastic, half metal, so let me show that one. So this one, um, the first few gears, which don't have a lot of torque on them, are plastic. And then the inner gears, which are metal, so the, the outer gears um, towards the output shaft, those are made out of machine metal. So, you know, it, it's kind of tough to know, like, when do you need full metal versus buy, you know, plastic metal um, gearboxes. A lot of it is just experimentation. You know, if you're, if you're using a project and you're using maybe the plastic or um, plastic metal gears and you're finding that the, the gears still strip once in a while, that's when you'd want to upgrade. Um, otherwise, these motors are the same size. They work with all the same accessories. You can use them with um, the same wheels and the pulley I just showed you, all that good stuff. They're just a little bit more durable, a little more expensive, a little heavier. But, you know, I figured, like, it's where to find motors um, like these available in full metal gearboxes. So I thought it would be kind of cool to carry in the shop. So that's why we got them. Okay, next up. Okay. We also have something non-robotic. Um, we have this uh, clear plastic padlock. This was a featured item in Ada Box 7. Um, people really dug them. They're great for learning lock sport and lock picking because they're fully clear. They also look really cool. Great if you're doing your like 90s hackers cyberpunk cosplay while you're also learning how to lock pick. But um, the uh, tumbler inside is, you know, is encased in plastic, and you can see it. So as you're picking it, you can see um, all the little uh, springs move. It's really great for the, you know, your first lock picking kit because you have that visual feedback, and then slowly you can learn the um, motion feedback and what to feel with the pick. But you know, it's also a fairly easy lock to pick in general. It's not like a super tough you know the they kind of made it so it's a little sloppy so it's easier to pick so start with this and once you get your confidence up um and you learn how to use the picks then you can graduate to fully metal locks but okay. it looks pretty cool works great as well and comes with two keys so. one note what's the voltages on those uh motors by the way oh they are three to six volts and we sort of recommend running them at five volts okay all right so i just uh, want to show the, the keys sorry you want to show the keys yeah i was about to grab the keys so great. it comes with some keys okay Next up, uh, glowy, it's glowing, it glows. Okay, this is um, glowy party. It's from Paint Your Dragon. 
and um, something that people have been asking for. We have the M0 feathers, and people wanted a way to control a lot of NeoPixels with them. And one of the problems with NeoPixels is that oftentimes in your microcontroller code, you have to stop everything, go right to the NeoPixels, and then you get back to what you're doing. If you have something like DMA, which is direct memory access, you can maybe set up the microcontroller to write to the pixels and you know make the make the pixels color uh, data sent. Sorry, send the color pixel data while you're also processing something else, like maybe a Bluetooth data or Wi-Fi data or calculating you know the colors you want, wh whatever it is that you want to do. So. For the Feather M0, the SAMD21, uh, Phil B like, poured over the data sheet and found that there's a waveform generator and that you can abuse this waveform generator with timer number zero to create eight channels of DMA NeoPixel output. So this demo is running with 144 LEDs um, on each of the eight outputs. Each, each one is individually controlled and it's fully DMA. So the microcontroller itself isn't actually doing anything but setting the color you know, memory data and then letting the firmware kind of handle all that um, pixel pushing in the background. You can do up to about 2,000 pixels total. Uh, that leaves you plenty of memory left over. And the wing itself, let me grab one. What's interesting about this is we have two configurations available. Let me go to the overhead. This is the Feather wing, so it works with any of our Feather M0s, the Feather M0 Basic, um, Express, uh, Blue Fruit, Wi-Fi, whatever. Although, you know, the, if you want the most pins, of course, the, the Basic and the Express have all the pins available. Because you're using the timer output, you do have to select, some of them have options, like you can use either digital pin 12 or you can use the UART RX pin. So you might want to cut a jumper and select which one, if you, you know, if you really need I2C available, um, you can select to use other pins instead. Basically, whatever the timer zero output pins are, you can, you can select them. And then there's two ways you can solder it together. Either you can have two RJ45 jacks, and um, each one of these has eight pads, so you get one ground and one signal as a twisted pair. And some people like these because it's just really easy to clip and connect um, your cables all at once. Or you can use uh, this two by eight header instead and not solder in the ethernet jacks and instead put this in, and then you get signal and ground pairs and they're just like 0.1 inch spacing. Let me show the demo so you can see what this looks like when it's assembled. This is like a, a big thing. So this, I have it. One over here, one over here. Yeah, I have it on a doubler. So this is a Feather M0 um, basic on a doubler. And then I have it with the ethernet connector. So yeah, it's really easy if you want to yeah, disconnect. We connect, disconnect here. I'll disconnect this one. Okay, two quick more. questions with this. Stop. Um, We'll do this now since it's part of this. Um, yeah. When would you use this DMA NeoPixel wing versus, um, you know, other stuff like Fade Candy, Raspberry Pi Zero, and then is there a way to use the same protocol that like the fan Fade Candy uses? We don't have a library example for Fade Candy. I mean, Fade Candy is good when you have a computer that's like has a USB output, and you're using that USB. You're, you're piping the data from a computer through USB to a device. The Fade Candy is kind of specialized for that. It has all the libraries and everything. This is handy when you have um, your microcontroller board and it's going to drive the pixels directly. Let's say you're reading data from an SD card and you're piping it out, or you're receiving data over Bluetooth or Wi-Fi or LoRa radio or whatever, and the computer is not necessarily directly involved. Um, again, you could make this into a Fade Candy, but honestly, the Fade Candy does a really good job. I don't. I don't think you need to recreate it. Um, it's about the same price to just get a fade candy and use that. But this is good when you want to have maybe uh, you know algorithmically generated data from the microcontroller and display onto the pixels. So it's just another way to drive a lot of DMA NeoPixels. A lot of people like the Feather M0 and they're like, well, I want to I want to do NeoPixel stuff, but because I have the extra processor time and the extra memory on the SAMD21, but I don't want to spend all of my time like bit banging these pixels I want to use DMA. So yeah. plus if you don't want to haul around a computer, stuff like that. Yeah, and okay. this has the level shifters and everything done for you. That's kind of what's nice about this feathering. The library itself, you don't actually need, you know, if you don't mind breadboarding it, you don't need to use a feathering. The library works just fine as is on any SAMD21, but this feathering just makes and you can sign up for Cricut now. Yes. We're going to talk about it so we can refer to this later, but uh, it is available for sign up. Yep. As soon as we have them stocked, you'll get an email. 
Um, Cricut is our low cost, easy to use electronics platform. Yep. Um, for, for robotics, robotics creativity, yeah. and interactive art. So here we are. Cricut is here. So this is our first prototype that we made off of the machine. Um, and the hand solder, the headers and everything on and attached a Circuit Playground Express to it. So we're going to have versions. This one is a Circuit Playground Express one to start off, but we'll have a Feather version and a Micro Bit version later. Yep. What's nice is the Circuit Playground plugs in. It bolts on like a biscuit um, directly with these brass. Mm, oh, shut off. yeah, we'll shut off. Get out of the way, LEDs. And um, we're going to be running the show a little bit later tonight, so you're going to see some videos of some of the things that we're making with Cricut. There's just so much going on here. So. Okay. It's real. Yay, so that's that. And then we go up here. So I have it actually connected up to these motors. So this is just an example. There's a lot of different outputs you can control with it. Probably. Let's turn it on. Back it off a bit. Whoa. Yeah, it's a powerful motor. I know, I gotta watch out. Full metal. Full, yeah, these are the metal motors. Um, take and drive, you know, motors. Uh, has eight signal pins. Four servos, uh, Darlington drive transistor for coils and solenoids and stuff, a NeoPixel with buffered um, five volt signal output, uh, a three watt speaker driver, so you, you know the audio that can come from the Circuit Playground Express can play through a speaker nice and loud, capacitive touch, and all this handled by um, a Seesaw chip, which is a little coprocessor that runs our um, open source Seesaw firmware that does all the work for you. So. All the PWMs required for the servos and the analog inputs, you know, you don't have enough pins on the Circuit Playground to do that. There's only like eight pins available. So instead we have the coprocessor do all of that work and then we send commands over I squared C. So the Circuit Playground can focus on doing like the Circuit Playground-y stuff and then um, driving motors, you know, setting the PWMs or reading capacitive touch is handled by the little helper. And it's, Actually, you know, when we did the design, it just turned out to be easier and cheaper to have a full other SAMD processor do that for us. Yeah. Even though it's not a lot of firmware, it just has all of the pins and all the timers that you need um, to do that. Yeah, one question that came up is, what is the micro USB port for, uh, say, Seesaw only? Because that's when you would just be updating the Seesaw. You wouldn't yeah. program the Circuit Playground with that. Yeah, the Circuit Playground is like this processor that does yeah. the code. But it was just so inexpensive to add a micro USB jack. And it, we probably will be updating the Seesaw firmware. Like, let's say we want to add rotary encoder support or optical encoder support, or like we want to make tweaks to the firmware. Um, it's just easier to tell people, hey, you know, there's a USB port just for up updating the Seesaw itself. You can connect over the micro USB jack and um, program it that way. But you can't program the Circuit Playground from this USB connector. It's just yeah. for the Seesaw. Okay, so we're going to be playing some videos in a little bit. We're going to be running the show later. But that's, uh, that's new products. But before we go on to that, I'll just say this. As we've been developing these robotics projects. Years, yeah. So one of the things that was hard, I'll say hard for me, but I think hard for everyone, is when you would make a Arduino project, you'd have to save it and then you download it. And if you're doing little tiny iterations, it just added a minute and then a minute and two minutes. And when you're doing robotics, you're doing a lot, lots and lots and lots of iterations. Especially like, cal like we, we did one project where you have to calibrate a motor yeah. to make it, it you would know, just match long. up. And just getting it like, okay, run it, and then, okay, try point one, uh, try point two, and then yeah. try point three to get the exact speed that you want. With CircuitPython, and especially with the REPL, it's instantaneous robot programming. And I think that real-time nature of uh, programming, especially interpretive languages, mm -hmm. especially for robots, especially for beginners, when you can instantly see what you're doing, and when you save it, it's running. Yeah, instant um, feedback, it's, instantly it's super fast. Powerful. Yeah, super so fast powerful. to do. Okay. Uh, we've been running all the code in CircuitPython. Yeah. Eventually, we want to support MakeCode as well. We're working on that. Yep. Arduino, it already supports, but uh, we think CircuitPython is where this really shines. So sign up in the store. Yep, coming soon. Okay, and this new product's like... Yeah.